Beverly and I'm Carol Frieswick and this is my messy studio like most people's studios. <laughs> right. And you did film us before when the two of us went out to Millville and Blackstone. We uh, went to get photos in three places, right? Yep. One was the lock. Millville lock. Then the other one was the water tower at near the police station in Millville. And then we went to the Blackstone Gorge. We and, went to four places. And then we went to, I don't know where it is, but it's near the baseball field where there are a um, nice big train trestle with six archways. Right, there was four places. Okay, and we went out hiking, had to get out of the house, and we wanted to get information for paintings. It was too cold to paint outside, so that's why now we're finishing this off by painting in Carol's studio. What are you going to paint? I'm going to paint one of the archways um, in Blackstone and I have it on my computer I think okay over, over there, there. Okay. and uh, there's a nice light coming in from the back and I want to try to capture that light and how it reflected on the inside of the trestle. Okay and I'll do Melville and um, you're going to do it in pastels right? I'm we're going to be working in pastels. Okay yeah. so I want to do something different and first I thought I'd watercolor but because we're going to go back and forth between the two of us, I thought acrylics dries faster and it'll be easier to be able to fit in, in between the pastels. So I'm doing acrylics and you're doing pastels. So this filming will be kind of jumping between the two of us. So I hope you enjoy it and uh, we need two minutes to set up. <laughs> okay. okay, this is the um, first... I think it's the first of six arches that go across um, this area and it's an old train trestle. The whole insides of these archways are all falling apart. There's one um, that the road goes through that I don't either the town maintains it or whatever but they've maintained the uh, the inner parts of this archway. You can see right here that it's all falling apart. There's other areas in here that are all falling apart too. But I just think it's it's really amazing um, that that structure is there and not in use anymore. There's built houses all the way around. All It's in the backyards of I don't know how many houses. But anyway, um, I like this one because it has a nice rim of light right here and it's reflecting on this opposite wall. So this is what I'm trying going to try to obtain. This light, in the, this um, backlit light, the nice shadow in here this bright light here and the reflected light there. Um, I, going very slowly, I usually print these up so that I can trace them. My printer is not working so I'm trying to draw it and the perspective is very difficult for me to try to figure out. <laughs> um, you have this line here that comes off the photo and then the inner arch over here. And this is what I'm trying to get, and it just doesn't look right. But I will continue, maybe with the pastels. I'm going to be doing this in pastels. Uh, <clears throat> what we do first is um, an underpainting, and you wash it all with alcohol, 70% alcohol. And it kind of gives you a nice background, and then you can lay um, your pretty colored pastels on top. So let me try to just get this drawn in a little better and we'll get the pastels out. For anybody starting out painting, perspective is a bugger. Unless you happen to be a retired engineer or graphic designer or one of those occupations that have been using this your whole life. It's, um, perspective is very difficult. Okay, I guess we'll give that a try. This is my wonderful box of pastels. These are Sennelier's, the Paris collection, and it's like a big box of candy. Mm -hmm. As you can see, there's every color of the rainbow in here. <clears throat> My docks, I've used a lot. They're getting kind of worn down. You drop these on the floor and they break into zillions of little tiny pieces. 
and if you happen to be on a rug they stain. So I am going to just put some colors in here. Um, a lot of pastelists when they're doing their underpainting some people use um, the complementary colors so that like if you hey, were doing a scene with a lot of trees you could um, put red in there and it, the vibration you know if you left some of that red in there when you're doing the pastels the vibration really makes a pretty a pretty scene so these are oranges I could probably do a lot of blue different blues we'll see what happens but you can see how bright and beautiful these colors are We had um, a workshop, a pastel workshop, not too long ago, and the lady that ran that had us use actually black ink for all the dark areas. And I did that one, um, if you can see, mm -hmm. all the black areas in that one there are done with actual black ink, and I left them like that. So it really saves on a lot of your pastels because. Um, like this one here is really big and I had a lot it had to use a lot of darks and it's um took a lot of pastels I've, <laughs> I've worn some of my really dark ones down that painting there was from a reference photo I took at the route 16 end of Riverbend after a storm This is the alcohol and watch what happens when I use this. You start with the darks. Sometimes if you use too much it gets runny and it drips all over the place which according to the the pastel masters they love it when it drips. To me it makes me nervous. I think it's looking more like a bridge. <laughs> All right, it takes about two minutes for that to dry. So this medium is extremely dirty to work with. Thus, <laughs> my painting clothes. <laughs> I get it everywhere. It's a powder. It's pure pigment. There's very little um, binder in these. So when you touch them, you automatically get it everywhere. I get it in my nose, in my ear, everywhere. I suppose it's not too healthy, but whatever. It's fun. You're going to die from something. You might as well have fun. <laughs> you saw the alcohol wash. I have put two different colors on my sky now. I use this one first, and then I use the lighter one on top. And I left some of the background color in there. So it kind of makes for an interesting sky. Usually what I do is I work from the back and work forward or work from the top down, which is basically the same. Um, <clears throat> different people, different audit. We have been watching a lot of videos this over the COVID situation. And Marla Bargetta, who is a <coughs> very prominent pastelist, um, she doesn't work this way. She will put all her foreground stuff in and then she has a, an uncanny way of sticking the sky holes all 
in between all the branches and stuff. I, it would take years and years and years of practice to be able to figure out how to do that. But she is a pro at it. She'll just take her pastel and just make little tiny marks and before you know it, the whole thing is there and it's absolutely gorgeous. So now there's a little bit of the sky underneath the bridge showing, so I'm going to put that in now. And as you come down to the horizon line, the sky goes, if you look outside, the um, zenith, I think they call it, the top part of the sky is more purplish and it gets bluer and lighter and lighter and lighter as you come down to the horizon line because <clears throat> there's so much more atmosphere down here and um, the atmosphere is full of particles and all that sort of thing so it dulls the color of the blue. So I want a really light blue down here. I don't know if this is going to be light enough or not. Yeah, not too bad. Now I have a tendency to get my fingers in here and blend a lot, which in the pastel world is a no-no. They they like fresh marks and they don't like you to blend. Now this board I'm working on is good for plein air studies because it's a solid board and um, it makes it easy. Otherwise it's usually sanded paper and you have to uh, adhere it to something because it's, it's floppy. It's kind of like watercolor paper. So you can see it's quite a bit lighter, but I think I want it a li little bit lighter even. Hence the need for my painting gloves. It's important to keep these colors clean in your box because otherwise you really can't tell what, what shades they are. There's all kinds of nifty ways of keeping them clean. Some people put them in uh, cornmeal. Some people keep them in rice and just kind of swirl them around a little bit and they, it automatically takes the outer layers off. All right, we'll see how that works. Next is the rock wall. So that we can, like, we, like um, Bev was saying, you can do all sorts of different colors. You don't have to use the colors that are there. But I also have a blue and orange color scheme here, so I'm going to stick with that. So I'm going to do orange tones in here. See if I can keep any of this blue shining through to make it a little more interesting. That's where if I keep my fingers out of it, I can show the blue. Otherwise, if I start getting my fingers in there and blending everything, I lose all my... These are all bricks, concrete bricks, I guess, or maybe it may be um, some sort of granite stones too. I'm not sure. I don't remember now. Do you remember, Bev, whether no, that I bridge was? Don't remember. It was gorgeous. Um, it'd be interesting to know who the engineer and how far back it dated, but no, I don't remember, Carol. They maybe use local stones, you know. Mm. I think that is the second longest aqueduct in the state right now. Is, is it really? Right? Yeah. 
Oh. Well, it, uh, it looks like an aqueduct, but I don't think it, it's an aqueduct. Oh, no. Well, it's a called a, it's called an aqueduct, but it's for trains. Yeah. I think that the aqueduct has to do with its structure. Yeah, it, it does. It looks like the European aqueducts. I think that's why I like it so much, because I would mm -hmm. love to go to Europe to see all those mm -hmm. old stone facilities they have over there. I'm kind of liking these bright colors. They say as you get older, um, you can see reds and that sort of thing better, and I'm beginning to think so because I'm starting to change my my favorite colors. be careful making these marks. I have to keep them all horizontal because that's the way the stones are built on this thing. start working on the inside of the archway here. There's a nice dark shadow right over here, so I'm going to put the dark in first. Maybe this dark brown. Down inside the archway here, this is really peeling away, and you can see the rebar and sort of uh, the construction pieces on the inside of it. It's really neat. In fact, I think I have a picture of it. Oh, it'll take too long to find it. You can send it to me later if okay. I can put it in. I thought it would look good in our macabre shows. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, as you can see, I've lost my little construction site inside here, so now I'll have to replace that eventually. I'm trying to get some nice light inside here. I think what I'll have to do in order to get this to look really light is probably to have to go over this again and make this a little darker. It's all a matter of contrast.
I'm trying to get this to light up and I'm having a lot of difficulty. I've tried um, making the archway itself darker and making my background in here a little darker. Um, as you saw before, I had a nice light sky in there. It's totally obliterated. Now I've got to put that back in. Um, but I think it's starting to light up now. It's just a matter of choosing the right color to put in there to make the um, to make it look lighter than the rest of it in the in the die in the photo itself it's not really it's rust colors and light oranges but it, it's not always easy to pick the right colors even with my box of candy here so what do you do if you have a color that's in between two of your colors Supposedly you can um, you can layer colors to get the right colors, but that takes some ingenuity. <laughs> That's why most pastellas, if you watch them, they have these huge, they're like five or six feet long mm -hmm. boxes, and they're all individual different colors, um, all laid in there according to um, values. They'll have the darker ones and then they get lighter and lighter and lighter and lighter and there's probably a hundred different pastels in each one of those sections. Wow. And at the tune of three or four dollars a piece, <laughs> that's a big investment. But they are just so much fun. Total instant gratification. You don't have to sit there like Beverly and mix paint. <laughs> and I hate mixing paint. Some people love it. I, I, I hate it. Some people can sit there all day and just mix paint. I suppose if you did Richard Smith's color charts, <laughs> um, it would be a real benefit to you to learn how to mix paint. And you probably wouldn't hate it so much. But it's such a tedious job. I refuse to do it. I want to have fun when I go out to paint. Is there a limit to how many layers of the pastel you can put on before? Yeah, there is. Um, usually this holds quite a few, but it doesn't seem to be... Uh, holding that many today. If you get to a point where it doesn't take any more, there is um, a fixative you can put on here and it makes it, makes all the pastel paint kind of melt into like regular paint and it's like starting from scratch. The teeth on the, on the sandpaper all come back. As you saw earlier, I painstakingly made all those little sky holes in here, and now I've lost them all.
Not too bad. Sure wish I could get that light inside that tunnel. <laughs> Thank you. 
Now I'm trying to get this corner here. If you see back there, it's really dark in this corner because the sun is shining on this side. So by darkening this corner, I think I've already seen that it's lightening this up. So that's probably where I should have started. They always tell you to start with your darks and go to your lights, but it's hard to remember all these little rules. Should you remember them, it does make your life much easier. <laughs> How did you get into pastels? Um, I don't really remember, to tell you the truth. But 
but I'm glad I did because I like it. If they weren't so expensive to frame, I'd probably use just pastels. <laughs> Is it that much different than watercolors, or would you consider watercolors the same problem? No, um, because you can't see the glare. That particular one right there has glass on it. Um, you have to use glass that is uh, either museum quality or maybe a step or two below, because otherwise it causes a terrible glare. If you can. See there's a portrait way, way down in the corner there, mm -hmm. the one with the red hair. You see all the glare in the glass? Mm -hmm. That's cheap glass in there. Mm -hmm. It really, really makes a difference. All the professional artists use museum quality glass on their pastels, and it is mucho expensive. Mm -hmm. I want to say maybe an 8 by 10 like that would cost $35 just for the glass. Wow. So when you buy pastels and you have to pay a lot of money, you know why you're paying a lot of money. <laughs> and the frame. Frames are quite expensive too, depending on which type of frame you purchase. But the frame does make a difference. Mm -hmm. You look around the room, you see some beautiful frames Carol has here. And she also has an attic full. <laughs> <laughs> frames are very addictive. <laughs> well, you have to somehow get just the right frame for the picture, so.
Carol, Carol, what are you up to? I'm trying to get that light, and I think it's that the light <laughs> up in that corner over there. Oh, it's looking nice. Takes a lot of fiddling. Kind of helps to fudge the colors sometimes. This is a purplish color, so it's a complementary color with the yellows. So do you get a sense when it starts to feel right to you? Yeah, sometimes. <laughs> this doesn't seem to be working today, but... 
That's crazy. Some days are better than others. Do you normally work with it in your hand while you're working on it? Yeah, unless it's a really big piece. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of a control freak and I don't feel like I have. <laughs> the professionals all say to use long brushes and stay a mile away from your painting mm -hmm. and get the rhythm of your arm into it. And <laughs> I just can't do that. We all have our methods. <laughs> well, it's probably hard on an easel to get all the angles you want on the little board. Yeah. And I think a lot has to do with your vision and... <laughs> Now there is this big tree growing right in front of it, but I can't decide whether I want to put that in or not. <laughs> I just might, because there's leaves on there, you know, it would be a little distraction from this. I'm going to try to put that tree in. <laughs> If you then change your mind, would it be a royal pain to get it back out again? Yeah. Nice light being cast on this side of the tree.
Tree's looking nice, Carol. Yeah. I'm glad I added it in there. <laughs> it can't kind of camouflage some of the other stuff. Well, I think that's about as good as I can get it for now. <laughs> Do you normally put pieces down and then poke away at them in a couple days? Oh, yeah. You put them away, and then every time you look at them, you say, oh, wow. You know, you watch somebody's video, and you come back, and you say, oh, I can try that on that and see how that works. That's right. <laughs> well, needless to say, these will go in the wash tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I think maybe if I can... The sky is so nice and dark and blue on the top of that photo, but mine, I think, is a little too dark. Mm -hmm. See if I can add a color to soften that a little bit. Maybe some purple. Kind of a bright purple. Oh. a little bit. Just 
change the angles on my branches. I added more rocks from the original where I should have maybe covered up how I get them up there instead of all that rock. But we'll see. Forever a learning experience. Absolutely. So, Carol, what are your tips for someone who's starting pestles? think. Well you have to be able to draw really good because a lot of um, competitions that you enter past cells in they actually or any competition they usually consider it a drawing and not a painting so you really need good drawing skills which I don't have. <laughs> I am getting better. <laughs> Um, since I've retired, I spend a lot of time doing this, so I am getting better with my drawing skills. But as you could see today, it was very difficult for me to get this archway here. Our friend Frank Robinson would have been able to correct that immediately <laughs> for me. <laughs> he is a former engineer and is one of those people that can draw, and he draws constantly. He always has a sketch pad and a pencil with him, no matter where he goes. And you can tell it has affected his ability to draw. So this, that, I guess, would be the most important thing, is to learn how to draw and to keep sketching and slowly start adding colors and but you must be prepared to get dirty <laughs> a lot of people don't like it because of that well, I think this is my finished product for the day beautiful nice fall day it was a beautiful day that day that we went out there to take oh, these pictures. It was great. People travel all over the world looking for inspiration to paint and draw, but I think we in the Blackstone Valley are very fortunate. We have all these varied landscapes right in our own backyard. The West Hill um, project over the dam that whole area is absolutely gorgeous no matter what time of the year you go it's totally flooded right now you can't even get to the fishing pole hole <laughs> uh, but it's really fun to go there every day it looks different Oh, and the same with the Blackstone Gorge. We've been there many times. Oh, the Blackstone Gorge. I, I've been dying to go there this weekend, and I haven't got there yet. That water must be roaring over that gorge right now. <laughs> and it is beautiful. Depending on which where the sun is, it's, it's just gorgeous. We're very fortunate to have that bikeway. We thank the American government for providing us with the <laughs> National Heritage <laughs> Bikeway. <laughs> <laughs>